showed you, uh, I showed you uh, BM Shamir, and I showed you Bonnet de Milo Lipton. And, um, uh, but what is common about both of these attacks is that, all the attacks I told you so far, is that they really, if you talk about them, you really have the systems architect sitting there and laughing at you, laughing in your face. Because we needed lasers, and we needed pulses, and we needed to be uh, close to the device under test, and we needed physical access. And you know, we needed to open the box. We maybe needed to kind of remove the silicone covering. Uh, this is uh, this this kind of uh, very ambitious uh, privileges for the attacker are one of the reasons that people aren't taking fault attacks uh, seriously enough. And now, uh, in the past couple of years, there were a bunch of uh, fault attacks which work with very uh, very reasonable threat models, very, very reasonable assumptions of the attacker. And what is exciting about these attacks is that, <clears throat> on the one hand, they innovate a lot in terms of what is the fault generation method. But one, the other thing which is cool is that they can build on so much knowledge from the fault attack community, from the smart community, of what can you do once you get this attack going. So you look at these papers and you see uh, there's a bunch of citations from the past couple of years, and then there's a bunch of citations from the 80s when people were attacking fault text. So it's very, 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 very exciting for me to read them. And two things that I want to cover today, uh, as far as my time will allow, are Rowhammer and uh, the DVFS family of attack, uh, clock screw, plunder, vault, and so on. So who here? has heard about Rohammer previously? Who heard about Rohammer? OK, right. So wow, I have six people functional in the chat. Seven, wow, fantastic. Great. I, I'm really proud of you. It's almost it's 7 in the evening, and it's nearly the end of the semester, and you're, you're working so hard. You're pushing the buttons. You're participating in the chat. I'm so proud of you. All nine of you actually responded to this. Right. Yeah, so yeah, left. Yeah, it doesn't really count. Um, so what is Rohammer? Rohammer is a fault attack. And it's a transient fault attack. It's to, excuse me, it's a permanent fault attack, which can flip bits in memory. OK, so uh, uh, once you hammer a piece of uh, RAM. Uh, I, I got to move a little bit, otherwise you can only see the cap and you can't see me, right? There's the sun right there. You can only, you can flip a bit and the bit in the memory stays flipped until you write something else to the memory. So it's permanent, it's not, doesn't break, doesn't destroy the memory, but it's a permanent fault. And what is really exciting about Rohammer is how you trigger it. Uh, so how do you trigger Rohammer? Uh, you can trigger Rohammer by reading from the memory. And you don't, don't even need to read from the memory you're trying to flip. You read from some other place in memory, and this causes the target uh, address to flip. So Rohammer requires memory read permissions. Who has, so where can I justify having this? So let's try to think about where would I like Rohammer to happen. So yes, indeed, in JavaScript you can uh, you can read memory, but I also need to have a situation where there is a secret on my system which I cannot access. So JavaScript is actually a fantastic situation where your web browser is sending you some code and you run this code, and obviously, uh, even though you agree to run the animation or whatever rendering or you know UI that the web page is sending you, <clears throat> certainly you have a lot of secrets on your computer which you don't want the web browser to be able to see. For example, your keystrokes or your passwords or your uh, you know ASLR or memory locations where your kernel is hiding. So JavaScript is a very good example. Uh, any other situations where on one hand the attacker can access memory and on the other hand the attacker can't just get out the secret and use it? Hmm. 
So yeah, so Stav and Vigo are suggesting uh, shared memory in the cloud infrastructure. So indeed, uh, I am running on a cloud server. So on the bare metal of this, this machine are two tenants, two virtual machines. One of them belonging to me, the other one belonging to the victim. There are ways of def defining where you go. And uh, <clears throat> and I'm not supposed to be able to access the victim's, the victim's VM. I don't even know it exists, but definitely they're on the same physical memory. And Ido is saying SSH server, another example, yes. So I can connect using SSH to a machine and I can get a terminal there, maybe to run my code and I can run all sorts of programs. And there is another user or maybe the operating system itself which has all sorts of secrets. And, and because there is a functional boundary by the operating system, I cannot, uh, I cannot break it. And, um, <clears throat> and you see here that there are like architectural boundaries, not cryptographic. This is the, the memory isn't encrypted. The memory is just blocked from me because of the way the CPU or the OS is built, right? So um, this, uh, this attack, uh, was uh, first discovered again by the reliability reliability or uh, uh, no uh, chip industry uh, in the paper uh, called flipping bits in memory without ex uh, accessing them. It was published not in a security venue but in a very highly ranked uh, computer architecture uh, venue called ISCA. And it took a couple of years, not a lot of time, and people uh, started using a uh, Rohammer offensively. But what is Rohammer? To answer that, I need to explain to you what is DRAM. So uh, I showed you last week that there's like a hierarchy of memory. The fastest memory are the registers inside the CPU. And then you have the L1 cache, L2 cache, L LLC, and then the DRAM. I told you when you get to the DRAM, you're, you've lost basically. Your performance is very slow. But what is a DRAM? So the DRAM is a very common type of memory, uh, which is volatile. Volatile memory means that uh, if you don't apply power to the DRAM, it will lose all of its contents. You're comparing this to non-volatile memory like uh, hard disks or SSDs. And uh, the DRAM is actually so volatile that you have to touch it every couple of milliseconds, just you know, read from it and write again, or it will uh, lose its, uh, its value. And that is because DRAM isn't using transistors. It's using capacitors. So there's a little capacitor. If you charge it with charge, then it has one. If you discharge it, then it has zero. And this capacitor uh, is slowly leaking its charge away as time passes. So you actually need to read it and write it once in a while. And this is something uh, uh, everybody knows. And yeah, uh, uh, SRAM is made out of uh, six transistors. Uh, SRAM is made out of a few flops. The DRAM. DRAM does not have any flip-flops in it. Um, so the DRAM is slow, dense, and cheap. What does it mean, slow? It means that accessing uh, memory in DRAM uh, takes a long time. It can take 50 nanoseconds, which is like a lot of time uh, when you're talking about the CPU, which can uh, do an operation in one third of a nanosecond. It's dense. Dense means that in a certain amount of area, you can fit a very large amount of memory. So um, you have uh, uh, like this, this, this DIM, and you can fit like 64 gigabytes of memory on it without any problem, and it's cheap. Cheap means that the cost per bit is very, very low. It's not the lowest, the lowest is tape, but so Stav is asking, is it, is it slow? because of data locality? No, it's not slow because of data locality. Uh, there are, uh, Intel, in, uh, I think Intel experimented with putting DRAM on the CPU, as they called it eDRAM. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, they used to do it, uh, but even if you put it on the chip, it's still slow because, um, you know what, I'll show you. Basically, you need to translate between these capacitors and the transistors and the SRAM. So I'll show you how it's done. And actually, the way it's done, is crucial to the understanding of Rohammer. So this is what we would call an excellent question. So um, we have a lot of, of DRAM. How much memory do you have on your computer? How much memory? How much? Eight gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, right? 
the LLC, the biggest bunch of uh, SRAM on the device is, uh, no, I'm not, the, the Terry is talking about are the SSDs, the solid state drives. They're slower. There is something called op Optane. Optane is like an Intel invention, which is as fast as DRAM and as permanent as, uh, as an SSD. Uh, but I still, there is somebody in the Technion already has a text for it, but I'm still not, I still don't need to research it yet. There are still enough things to break without opt-in. Uh, but uh, so uh, you see, you, you have eight, eight megabytes of cache is like, wow, what an awesome computer. And you can have eight gigabytes of SRAM, 32 gigabytes of, of DRAM, sorry. So um, as I told you, you don't actually directly access the DRAM because it's so slow. There is like a hierarchy of, of cache, cache memory, fast memory, which actually uh, caches contains copies of the important parts of the DRAM. But let's say I really do need to access the DRAM. So um, this is not a very high quality slide, I apologize. But to get from the DRAM, from these capacitors, to the CPU, which is using uh, wonderful. To get to the CPU, which is using transistors, I need to translate between these capacitors and uh, SRAM. So there is something called a row buffer. A row buffer is a bunch of SRAM, a very small amount of SRAM, which is present on the DRAM chip. And when I want to read memory from the DRAM, I do what is called a row operation. I don't want to go into it. You can read uh, all sorts of uh, videos on YouTube, which are also explain it. But you need to activate the row. You activate the row. And then all of the values of the row are copied into the row buffer. And then you can copy the row buffer. You can read the row buffer from the row buffer. Is from. So you send the content of the row buffer over to the CPU. So every time you need to read from the DRAM, you open the row, you copy it into the row buffer, and then you close it again. And opening and closing, this is a, an operation which needs to, you need to open and close all the rows once in a while because otherwise the DRAM wears out because it's many capacity. So there is like kind of a circuit which constantly refreshes the DRAM. So um, to access memory in DRAM, you open the row, you copy it to the buffer, and then you close the row. So um, what did the guy from ISCA discover in 2014? Uh, so because of some electrical phenomenon which isn't completely understood, when I open a row, so if I open this row, I actually drain a little the row above it and the row below it. So the value stored in the row above and the row below are a little degraded. You know, the, the charge is slightly discharged. Uh, or the zero suddenly wants to become not zero, but maybe half. Every time I access a row, I drain the row above and below. They drain it, they drain it but just a tiny little bit. But if I activate and deactivate really, really quickly, and I'm talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of times in a few milliseconds, what happens is that the victim row becomes corrupted. So uh, what you're seeing here in the figure is what is called the double-sided row handle. And the idea is there is a target row. So this is memory. This is just a bunch of memory. Row number two has victim's memory. And row number one and row number three have the aggressor's memory. They have the attacker's memory. Now, the attacker is not allowed to see what is inside row number two. Why isn't the attacker allowed to do it? Who is stopping the attacker? Who is stopping the attacker from seeing? Right? There is memory virtualization. There is some kind of a virtual memory. There's protection. There is a hypervisor. So this memory, this row of memory doesn't belong to the attacker. It belongs to the victim. But these two rows belong to the attacker. It's certainly something that can happen. 
And now the attacker is looking at row number one, opening row number one, closing it, opening row number three, closing it, one, three, one, three, one, three. It's hammering. This is called row hammering. It's just, it's just hammering, hammering, hammering row one, one, three. Every time it hammers row number one, rows zero and two are drained a little bit. Every time it taxes row number three, rows four and two are, ham are drained a little bit. And if it's doing this very, very quickly, then row number two is going to get drained so much that one of the bits there are going to flip. And this is the row hammer attack. Hamming distance of, or, or weight, can you, can you kind of explain the question a little better? One of the bits in row number two is going to change from zero to one or from one to zero. Why is zero and one and one to zero? I don't have time to cover here. Uh, the actual bits, one of the bits in this row is going to get flipped. And it's going to stay flipped until the victim writes some other value to row number two. And this is row hammer. So, no, you can't read it. The, the attacker cannot read row number two. The attacker can only flip a bit in row number two. Some kind of it. Now, um, the question is, uh, you might ask the question, which bit is going to be flipped? And to answer to that, first of all, uh, you can assume that there is a memory templating phase where the attacker has control over this row and the attacker kind of tries to figure out if I do hammering, you know, it's kind of profiling the memory and says, you know what, this row, I can get it to flip bit number three. And now I'm going to wait until the victim sits down in that row and I can bit, I flip bit number three. That's one option. The other option is if you do something like is inspired by BM Shamir, you're saying I'm going to use a fault which needs a bit to flip and I don't care which bit is being flipped. So both of these things are, are, are valid assumptions. 